Hello, everyone. My name is Dabankur. I'm a soil health specialist with the University of Arizona, uh, Environmental Science and Property Extension. Um, I'll talk about like how we measure soil health, right? Now, traditionally, what we do when we think about soil testing, we think about collecting a soil, putting in a bag, sending it to a lab, and analyze that. But time has changed. So we have now technologies that then scan soil um, in different ways and uh, measure soil parameters, right? But it's been a long time, and uh, Pedro is one of my uh, close collaborators in this kind of work. We are trying to figure out how enriched the data is. So let's say we are scanning a soil from above, but there are so many different variables that's affecting the soil's color, nature, uh, heat coming out of soil, and there is crop again. So there are so many different things that can affect the measurement. So we are trying to figure out. Well, we can get a soil sample, run the soil sample in a lab, test it, find the results, send you a data, and explain what we have seen. But how come? So there, how come a farmer, a producer, a grower can see that and test a soil or identify the changing parameters in their own field that a lab testing personnel cannot see? So. When we take a soil sample and get it into a lab, there is a, there is a boundary that, that, that is created. We do not see what is happening in the field. We just have a soil sample and kind of guess what is happening. Now for a farmer or a grower, they're seeing what is happening in the field. And then if they have some measuring um, implements, uh, then, then they can, figure out, oh, actually this is happening and can guide soil testing and recommendation uh, in a better way. So today I'll talk about some of those, we call it ex situ, where we take the soil sample, bring it to a lab, measure it, test it. Some of those soil health measurement uh, parameters. And also we'll talk about some very recent uh, work that we started doing, um, or some of them are very old actually, but we started, learning about it um, more of, I mean, learning more about it very, in very recent times. We'll talk about some of those stories. Uh, so we all know what soil health is. I keep telling about this over and over. It's about if a soil is performing the way a soil should perform. And it, it, it depends on the context, right? If it is agriculture, the context is probably having a good water quality, produce a, 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 a better crop and probably a better quality crop. Not only the yield, but also the quality of the crop. And then the environment also comes with agricultural settings. So if the soil is performing all these functions properly, we call it a healthy soil. If not, if we see we can improve in some way, then we think, okay, soil is not healthy enough. We have to work on it and we have to figure out how we work on it. And these are the main factors we look at, no matter what you'd send it to a lab or not. These are some factors we can probably feel it, not directly, let's say soil fertility. Oh, you cannot look at a soil and can guess how much nitrogen is there, but your plant will respond. Plant will show symptoms if you don't have enough nitrogen, right? Or if you have too much nitrogen or too much of a nutrient. So the thing is, these are the, parameters that we can test in the lab, but we can also feel or, or, or understand in a field. You can look at a soil and can tell, okay, this soil has more organic matter than the other. Just looking at the color, feel it, uh, looking at how easily water is moving through, you can talk about the <laughs> and the physical structure. You can, you, can, you can even look at the structure of your soil, you know, and how, how nicely aggregated it is, or if it is not aggregated at all. So you need some aggregation um, uh, to, to solve, uh, to solve, uh, to, uh, to make a soil function the way you want to function because it's not only the plant is dependent on the soil, it's also all the elemental cycles going through soil, through water, through atmosphere and coming back to soil. Because with the pores, with the water, with the air, everything moves around the system. Soil is a leaky system. So it's a porous system. So the structure, and when we talk about soil health, 
And we, we, had, we used to use a term called soil quality. And we used to talk about irrigation. We used to talk about uh, of the physical structure. Now, and we ignored in, in a way the biology part of the soil. Then we brought in a term, uh, which is soil health now, just to include biology more and more. But then we started forgetting about the physical structure, the quality of the soil. When we should consider all of it together, Soil quality, soil health is nothing. I mean, my, my body's quality is like probably how much muscle I have, what is my bone structure. But then my health is how well I'm functioning. I might have a very good bone structure, but I might not be functioning well, or vice versa. So we cannot really forget soil quality concept. And I, I start talking about it and people kind of try to mark me as a soil health when I am a soil person. I, I think about soil management, right? So these are the factors, right? These are this is what we measure now. This is uh, I worked with some of uh, some of you, uh, and then I probably shared some data, and there are some terms, right? And if you go to any 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 lab, any commercial lab that does soil health analysis, can be Cornell, Oregon, World Lab, or any lab, they will use this parameter. So I'm trying to explain if you are interested or if you have. Uh, tested your soils and they probably provided you with some explanation. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a more, more, what I can say, a briefer idea of this parameter. So whatever the name is, in short it's PMN, uh, it's potentially mineralizable nitrogen. What it is, is actually not the available nitrate in your soil, but a step before it becomes nitrate. So when you send to a lab and, and you measure NPK, you measure the available form of nitrogen, which is ammonium or nitrate. So while well, plants mostly need nitrate, but some plants can take ammonium too. Um, so before it becomes ammonium or, or ammonium or nitrate, it comes from, uh, so ammonium converts into nitrate generally. Uh, there are many different steps. So uh, we measure actually ammonium, which is bound in the soil and not available to the plant. So it's a source, it's a sink. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a resource, it's a reservoir of nitrogen in your soil. So you might have data on nitrates and NPK available, but this tells you what is the, the, the reservoir, how much nitrogen you actually have for not only the plant, but also the biology. And we cannot only think about uh, our, our, our plants because we are growing them, right? We can always apply fertilizer and give it to the plants. And, but we also think about biology. Biology needs to work to cycle nitrogen, right? So biology makes it possible from ammonium to nitrate. So what we exactly measure is a reservoir of nitrogen in soil, which is not right now available to the plant, but maybe potentially be available to the plant in future. So that's one parameter. We talk about active carbon. Now, now this is not a, I should have put it large, but you know, it's kind of a jargon there. Like there are, like we all know about carbon and there are many parts of carbon, but only a tiny fraction of the carbon, which is actually usable, which, which is actually usable by the microbes, right? Plants get carbon from atmosphere. We get carbon from uh, plants, but the microbes, they are dependent on the, the organic matter, the carbon-based materials that is in the soil, right? And this active carbon is only the tiny fraction of the total organic matter. So let's say you have a root system, right? You cut the crop, you have root in the ground. Now, root probably has the least amount of active carbon because most of the roots is just lignin and not non-usable carbon fractions, non-usable by the biology. So we cannot only leave roots or residues with high carbon content. Because high carbon doesn't mean it will have higher carbon for the microbes to be uh, uh, to be cycling the, the carbon through the system. When I say cycling, I mean it becomes carbon dioxide or it becomes microbial carbon, microbial biomass carbon. So carbon and nitrogen, these two are main factors that microbes are interested in. There are other factors, but these are most abundant uh, elements that, that are 
that the microbes are interested in. So if you have enough active carbon in your soil, then only you can expect a good biological activity. You can add a lot more probiotics, but if you don't have active carbon in the soil, then you, you cannot expect microbial activity because they won't have carbon. They don't have access to carbon. There might be carbonaceous material, but there is no active carbon. And the name kind of says it. I mean, active carbon, right? Um, so, now respiration, okay. Respiration, we know what respiration is. Uh, release of carbon dioxide, right? Through metabolism. That's same, that's um, the concept is exactly the same. Now in the soil, you have roots that is respiring. Uh, you have, because roots cannot photosynthesize most of the time, it doesn't have the chlorophyll. So it respires. So the plants also respires, but the, the quotient, the, the ratio between uh, the, the carbon dioxide uptake and, and you know, release is different. So roots do respire, and it is, it is a large amount of carbon dioxide. Yeah. The other source of carbon dioxide in the soil are from um, microbial respiration. So microbial is respiring metabolism, right? Or microbial decomposition of organic materials. So when microbes decompose organic materials, so carbon becomes carbon dioxide. Now, when carbon becomes carbon dioxide, it is released to the atmosphere, so you lose carbon. So it's a negative carbon, uh, a carbon negative process. So we're losing carbon. And we, we, we hear the term about carbon sequestration. Sequestration means like hideaway, right? So you have to make carbon or, or convert or carbon or transform carbon in a, in a, in a way so that it, it cannot be released as carbon dioxide. The only, there are only a couple of ways. One, you grow a plant, plant will trap carbon, and you, you make sure that they don't lose or decompose the carbon as carbon dioxide as well. The second way is you, you ask the microbes or you provide environment for the microbes so that microbes create a lot a community or colonies of microbes. And then they're using the carbon to create the colony because they need carbon and nitrogen to make higher microbial population, right? That's what we need, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and, and, and oxygen. Those are the four elements. So carbon and nitrogen can also be sequestered in, in microbial biomass. And we can measure those microbial biomass, carbon, nitrogen, they're, they're traditional soil health uh, parameters or non-traditional soil health parameters. So there are two ways, and then this, Respiration is actually talking about all these different ways we are actually losing carbon. Now, some loss is important. Some loss also comes from microbial activity. How actively microbes are decomposing the carbon, carbonaceous materials, because otherwise the nutrients bound in those organic components will not be released. We expect your, your soil to, to, to work in a way that it, you, you break down those decompos, uh, those organic materials at a rate which is sustainable, slow, and, and, and kind of controlled by the microbes. It should not be uncontrollable. When, when it becomes uncontrollable? When you have carbon, but you do not have enough nitrogen to create microbial population. So you have carbon, but you do not have fertile soil or water for a microbe to create their population. So what they do, they need the carbon anyways, it's, it's available. They will just use it up, make carbon dioxide, and you are losing carbon. So you have to create an environment where you have ample amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, water, and everything, but it doesn't really happen all the time because it, what kind of residues you're leaving on the ground, that kind of dictates the carbon and nitrogen content of the material. So microbes, if they don't find enough nitrogen, they will just use it up, the carbon, because they can use it and they will use it and it goes to atmosphere and lose carbon. So, or if you provide a good environment, they will not use it as fast. So what happens in Arizona, we do not have enough fertility when we do not grow a crop or do not irrigate, right? So what happens, whatever materials there is, whatever the microbes can utilize, they, they use it up very, very fast in a non-sustainable way, making too much carbon dioxide emission. Uh, and I, I'll tell you why I'm telling you this, this story, because we have a project where I'm working with Pedro and we're trying to measure that actually. And I'll show you how we can see these signatures, right? Like 
So when I say sustainable way of releasing carbon dioxide and non-sustainable way or a very fast way of releasing carbon dioxide, that makes the difference. That is what, what we, we can monitor and we can figure out, oh, this is a good system. This is not, right? So soil respiration is a measurement of carbon dioxide release from soil from different sources. We can track things and we can probably figure out how much coming from roots, how much coming from soil or microbes, right? But if you have two comparable systems, both cartons, and you know that their growth is more or less same, so their probably root growth is more or less same, so root respiration is same. But if you see a difference in, in the carbon dioxide emission coming out of the soil, you probably expect that it's probably coming out of microbial activity. And that's where I'm interested in. There are scientists using stable isotopes to figure out how much root is respiring, how much decomposition is happening, and how much microbes are respiring. We're not interested in that in currently in our current projects. We're trying to figure out if we can compare systems, which is a healthy system, which is a not healthy system, right? <laughs> protein, protein is protein, exactly what you can think of. It's a nitrogen-based material. It is another or more complex version of the PMN, the mineralizable nitrogen we talked about, the ammonium content, this is more complex because it, it includes all nitrogen-based materials in the soil, mostly all, we call them protein. So it's also a reservoir. It is not available to the plant. This, this uh, uh, protein is not available to the plant right now, but it, it gives you a sense how much nitrogen fertility you might have in the season or during the season, or if you have a good biology or not, because if you keep seeing the protein level is intact and it's, it doesn't show you any, any changes, that means you do not have the microbes that can use up these proteins and make this make release of this nit nitrogen-based uh, elements, can be nitrate or ammonium. So this parameter can also tell you how healthy your soil is, how good microbial community is, right? PLFA, I mean, I think people are getting more interested in it. I, ran almost 800 samples, not bragging about it. I, I just do not like this parameter. But there is an interest. One sample cost you $92 in the cheapest lab in United States. That's the cheapest cost. One sample and dollars What it tells you in different, different communities and their microbial biomass. That's it. It doesn't tell you if they're active or not, if they're working properly or not. It doesn't tell, but it gives you a sense of, do you have enough microbes or little microbes? And it also doesn't differentiate between beneficial microbes or pathogenic microbes. It just gives you a total number. And that's why I hate about this, this, this parameter because I, I, I ran personally when I was a postdoc, we, we had a PLF machine. It cost you $62,000 for the machine, right? And it's a very high-end machine. It, it measures, it's, you cannot complain about the machine. The problem is the output, the, the data that comes out of it, we scientists are still figuring out how we can best use it to decide management solutions. We, we can look at the data, that's me. Uh, we can look at the data, but we cannot really say, okay, now what to do, right? I know that if you see a higher protein or lower protein, I can say, well, you do not have uh, enough, enough uh, microbial activity that can use up these carbonaceous or nitrogenous substances. So probably you need a biological that can break those down, or you probably need some compost or something that can break them down and help with the thing. Here, looking at just the number, and another thing is, this is very, very sensitive to space. So I, I sample here, I go five feet, literally five feet, and I sample there. The numbers are different because it, it looks at, so if you see the fatty acid, it, it looks at a signature. So we all, all, all biology have some different kinds of fatty acids. So it, it looks at the signature of the fatty acid chain, so the, the biomolecules, right? So it doesn't, doesn't have, it doesn't, this, this process doesn't have a way to differentiate between species level. So we, so all the microbes are not good and all the pathogens that we know they are pathogens, probably the fungus, let's talk about fungus. They, they can be pathogen, but they're not all bad. They become pathogen probably under some stresses. Uh, so if you, when you look at the whole, 
you're like confused what you should do. And I have read papers and I'm, I wrote a paper and we probably spend 20% of our total funding on this analysis. In the whole paper, we probably wrote two lines on this because it's not usable. It doesn't tell you stories. If you don't have stories, you don't have reasonings. It doesn't help a grower or producer to design management tools. It's not helpful. So we did not publish a lot of work on this. But the one thing we figured out that, well, this is probably not the first test we will do. Well, me and Pedro are working on a project. We are measuring some of this, but we are doing on a larger scale. So we are not trying to find difference between like smaller plots, but we're looking at if there is a change in the same place, you know? So we, can, we cannot really understand the variability between systems and stuff easily. But we're trying to figure out and we're trying to connect it with other, other technology. But alone, it does not really tell you much. It gives you a good sense, oh, I have better biology. But well, are you, are you getting a benefit out of it? No answer. Okay. This is one, uh, and I have this uh, on my table. Um, so this measures how resistant your soil irrigation irrigates are. Very simple. We just plunge it in the water and see how resistant they are. This is probably a lot. It probably cost you like five bucks per sample, or oh, sometimes or ten bucks maybe per sample. But this is probably tells you. This this can probably tell you a better information and give you a better information on your soil cell, because you can say, well, our soil is more aggregated. So we probably have better biology going on there. We probably have more micro aggregates and stuff like that. And we can really analyze different particle size and say what type of aggregates we have. And you can look at micro versus macro aggregates. Now, why aggregates are important? Because when it's drought, there is no water, you are not irrigating, there is no crop growing. Where will these microbes go? They live in those micro aggregates where there is water because water cannot evaporate from those microspores. So they stay there. So there is a small ecosystem going on in the micropores or the microaggregates where this biology can thrive. So if you have more microaggregates, you are providing more residential area for those microbes that can stay during non-crop season, especially in the desert. If you're not irrigating, there is no water. You are not, you don't have a crop, you don't irrigate. So where they will go, they can stay in those micro -grids. So this test can probably give you a sense of how, many, how much micro -grids you have. How you have. Is that related to structure? Yes, complementary structure. Yeah. So if you know your soil horizons and the structure of the horizons, could you estimate aggregate stability or? Is that that estimates aggregate stability? Okay. Yeah, exactly. You can calculate. So right now, for 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 my work, I'm just using one. We are using a stability index. So one is too stable, like maximum stability. Zero is no stability. So our average is 27, 28 percent. So it's not great, but it's not bad too. We found some like 0 0.35, 0 0.36. But most of the average, it is like 0 0.27, 0 0.25. And are you looking at aggregate stability in tilled soil? And, and yes, it's all good soil. Tilled most, soil. Uh, we have, we sampled some of those no-till, uh, strip-tilled soils, but majorly it's conventionally right, tilled. Conventional tilled. Yeah, I, I did, I, I, I'm not showing any survey data, but if you're interested, I, I can share some survey data. I just wanted, yeah. I just wanted. So <laughs> I'll start with the most basic tool that we use. Is a moisture sensor. Now I will say, oh, moisture, how, how does it relate it to soil health? It is related to soil health. It's probably the major factor telling your soil health. So what do we do? Uh, so you see, we these are very expensive. They're now, now, so it, it's from 2018. Nowadays, there are a lot cheaper, a lot easier versions of uh, moisture. So what it tells you, during the growing season or outside growing season, did you have enough moisture? It doesn't matter what you have in the surface, but below ground. And when you go and sample, it's always hard to like break the top layer. Then we go around or push the shovel and you can go easy because there is moisture. 
And that hard layer that happens, it actually saves or stores those moisture. So we need to know the profile of moisture. And this is the first indication and the easiest way you can know that if soil is healthy or not, a healthier soil will keep moisture for a longer time. That, that's it, that's simple. And, 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 and we'll have almost uniform distribution of moisture up to a certain level. Uh, uh, be kind of just below the surface till the root zone. Below that, there will be saturation or there might be saturation in some conditions like this is from Midwest, there will be saturation. But here, you should probably see a gradual change in moisture or a, a good amount of moisture if, you have a, if your system is good enough. And you can, you can track that. And I'm more interested to see what happens when you don't have a crop, you're not irrigating. What is happening to your soil moisture then? How it is moving? So we, we checked with simple using cover crop versus no cover crop. So cover versus no cover, green is cover crop. So we had a system where we had a cover and then we had a no cover plot side by side. And I looked at it and you see cover crops actually kept more moisture because you know, it has residues, it, it, it controls evaporation and stuff like that. And it was against what was happening or what we thought would happen. <laughs> because generally cover crop takes up moisture, right? That, that's our sense. Cover crop takes up moisture because it needs to grow, right? Yeah. But what happens when there is no cover crop? The after effect, how you manage then the cover crop, the, the residue of the cover crop, that's what you need to And that's when you start seeing things. So late fall winter, there is no cover crop and it just keeps a cover, right? It, it can catch more moisture mm -hmm. because the surface is rough. And it can, it can conserve some moisture because it can impede the rate of evapotranspiration and evaporation, things like that. Not evapotranspiration, it's evaporation, right? It kind of put a barrier to evaporation, right? And uh, then another tool, like this, this tool. So people were looking at our chrome population. I went to a conference and I meet, met uh, Keith Burns, he's a owner of a, cover, a seed company, Green Cover Seeds. So he was a nice stalker. And I, I talked to him, I said, well, biological tests are all expensive. He said, no, do our work test. That's biological test. Now then you, you spend like $5, you, you're probably good for the year. Because we used vinegar and uh, master solution. So we found uh, an art form specialist in our, our university. We found a protocol that they use for speciation projects. And we just figured out, okay, we'll use that project. We don't have to figure out how, what species it is. We just need to know what is the biomass and how, how many earthworms are there. That's what we are doing. That's not me, uh, my, my, my friend John. And this, these are the earthworms that's coming out of it. And we just counted it. We had to wait, maximum we had to wait like 40 minutes. and. Between 15 to 40 minutes, you will, you will, you will be done. So it's, it's not a big, big job, but you can do as many as replication you want to do. We, we created that, that ring and everything. And the results are, are great because it tells you the biology that you created on the cover crops. It controlled weeds, right? So you probably did not have to spray some weedicide or herbicide, right? Uh, so the chemi chemical, uh, interaction in the soil were less. So the biology survived and it's drastically different. Um, then this is kind of my brainchild and I did some demonstration in, so NRCS was doing a, a buried under, underwear kind of test, right? Now I, I looked at that and I was like, that's great, but it's not only weight loss, we can also, strategize to make it a more complex system. And we can look at pigments. So what we actually did is like, we just source, it's a top corn after the cover crop and we buried them and we used to retrieve them after 14, 21 and 28 days. And they would look like this. It's very, very delicate, very delicate. And we don't see any color because you did not do the project. I did. I cannot see any color because I did not do the project. One grad student. So I we trained one grad student, and he did all the work. I think we had uh, around two hundred plus samples, 
that he walked and he figured out there are four distinct colors that he can figure out. And I'll show the, the colors uh, next. And we did not worry about what species were there, but idea was, if you see more pigmentation, definitely there were more microbial activity. If you see different colors, more different colors, microbial diversity. We kind of trying to connect very simplistic. Now we could do, and we were talking, then I left South Dakota and joined here. We were trying to figure out if we can just get the pigment out and we can get the species because there will be uh, genetic materials that we can get, but it is more complex. It is not easy, but this, any farmer can do it. And, and if someone trains, like the student trained themselves, you know, they can clear out, okay, there are, and they, we found some, some, uh, some of those carbon strips, as we call it carbon strip, uh, this is just, we bought it from Walmart. It's fully 100% carbon, like 99% actually, <laughs> it's not 100, but it, we just made it up dimension, but we figured out if you can train, you can see more colors actually. Some of them had like seven, eight different colors, but we kind of excluded them and kind of categorized based on four different colors. And these were our, our treatments. So we had different, you know, cover crop mixes. The blend was a 50-50 mix of grass and broadleaf based species. Then grass is dominant in grass, broadleaf is dominant in broadleaf. And we had a check, all, all that came out is volunteers. And we used to plant them, by the way, in a grower's field. Um, now, this is what grass looked like, broadleaf looked like, and this is what blend looked like. And th this was like a mix. I mean, it's like very simple mix. We just told the seed company that we need this many pounds of this and made it like 120 pounds or something like that. Well, we here, I, I recommend people to do like 150, but there we used to do like 80 to 100 and not before more than that for cover crop uh, seed rate. Um, these are the four different colors. Now, this is this was not that bright, but I wanted to make sure that there are four different distinct color that you can you can you can kind of see, and 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 that the 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 cotton strip that I showed that was the last stage. There were two stages before also, so you can see that uh, fourteen days after burial, and twenty one and twenty eight. And what we found under under blend, which is like fifty fifty of broadleaf and grasses. We had the maximum diversity and total pigmentation if we score them, right? Very simple scoring. There is nothing that technical. It's just looking at the pigmentation, how much pigment a uh, uh, um, cotton strip has gotten, right? So are you talking about shades of brown then? <laughs> so is that it really is when you talk about the colors? Maybe. Maybe it is shades of brown. Maybe we'll find the same species having more pigmentation or, or with time it changed color. Don't know. but we were most interested like total like how much coverage was there and that's that was main and then we thought okay if there are different maybe it's different diversity too right but definitely like the yellow so three of them like brown gray black these three are under same kind of categories like i looked at those i did not put those names like you know but the yellow was different so definitely like two groups for sure like carotenoids and um, and something else. So that's for sure. Definitely two different groups. <clears throat> anyway, and we published it, by the way. And we never thought that we would publish it, but we published it. And they, they just liked it. And I got calls for this one. And they said, what did you do? I said, we did nothing. And they were a little disheartened because we didn't do anything scientific. <laughs> okay. Now we are talking about something that I'm working with Pedro. So this is all this machinery is created by Pedro's team, right? And when I joined, the first thing, first discussion happened between him and me is how we can. So this is a device that can measure carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, right? Um, and uh, this this uh, this kind of sensor was there before, but no one. Put it like this way, what, what, what they did. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll do a very bad job explaining the engineering part. So I will not do that. So if you have any interest, please uh, talk to Pedro and he can give you more details. What, why I was interested, it could measure carbon dioxide emission. And we are always talking about carbon. So it's just positive versus negative. So if you measure carbon dioxide, that's the only carbon loss that is happening from your soil. There might be different ways you can add carbon. 
you can only lose. So it's a carbon mineralization, right? Carbon to carbon dioxide is carbon mineralization. We talked about nitrogen. So we talked about ammonium to nitrate. See the oxygen is coming in. That means oxygen, nitri nitrogens are mineralizing, getting more available. Carbon, when it becomes yes. easily available, it goes in that atmosphere. It's a gas, gas, right? Yes. So first we tested at different crops. We tested what are the signatures and if we can get consistent signatures of carbon dioxide emission. And I said, well, why don't we deploy in the ground without much uh, interference from other systems and so that we can measure the carbon dioxide emission coming out of the ground. And that's why you can see this is deployed very close to the ground. And it's, it's one inch above the surface, right? So it's as we, we really kind of excluded any kind of interference. So it measures carbon dioxide. And it, we talked about CO2 respiration, carbon soil respiration. So this is a device. Now, this that was ex situ when we do in the lab. This is in situ because it is, it can, you can do it in the field. We deployed it in different fields. Now it is deployed in wheat fields and we're still on, the research is still going on. There are so many things that we don't know, but we can see things. So definitely we can see this signature. So this white line is in a fallow. And then we had a wheat where we put side by, I mean, the same system. And we can see the under wheat, you see microbial activity, why? Because wheat is feeding the microbes, wheat is through exudates, is feeding the microbes and you're eating it. So you are providing them water. So a, a crop system is actually making your soil healthy. So when you talk about soil health principle, talk about continuous roots, this is why we, are, we, we, are, we talk about that. Continuous roots will continue, living roots will continuously feed the microbes and have carbon dioxide emission that you can measure. Now, when we deployed during some uh, climatic adversities, like rains, high wind, we found this kind of signature. So we can see this sensor is sensitive to changes in atmosphere. So it is good, it's measuring. So it's not only giving you a consistent, so we, we measure days after days, similar signatures, similar peaks. See, during the daytime, noon, no activity at all, then as it, gets the first breathe. It can, it, like the sun goes down, come up, peaks, peaks. <laughs> they know exactly when they're going to stop their activity. Before that, they showed some peaks of activity, right? So we did see this distinct pattern over, across all the crops we looked at, different, different ranges, but similar patterns of, of carbon dioxide emission. And yes. Did soil? Did you take into uh, account soil temperature? Yes, this 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 device measures soil temperature oh, too. Okay. Yeah. So did you do it just during a growth period, or did you do it during the winter too? Winter too. Yeah. We, oh, we, we, we still have some some machines, some of this uh, instrument deployed for for spring wheat, and during winter time we had vegetables. We had deployed. Okay. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. All the time you can see this kind of the the ranges will will be different. The carbon dioxide measurement, but the pattern of this, this peaks and everything, it's so overlapping. It's so nice to see, it's so consistent, right? So what we did, we looked at, so Pedro had a plot where he cover cropped cotton. So he grew cotton, then did not take it through the, uh, you know, um, through the harvest. So he cover cropped it, green manured it. Kind of, so cotton is a green flower crop. And he grew cotton the next year. So there was a fallow before a cotton and then a cover crop, which was a cotton cover crop, green manuring cover crop before cotton. And see the difference when you don't have in the fallow. So see, we are losing almost 1,000 ppm of carbon dioxide from a fallow system because you do not have food for those microbes, don't have those nitrogen, those juicy plant materials that has nitrogen. So you're losing at so high rate. So you are actually, this, this, is, this is the loss from a fallow system when you do fallow. When you had a cover crop and you had residues and that was not on top even, it's just incorporated because you know it was steeled in. Still, 
the range, if you remember the uh, previous range, the range was almost close to carbon dioxide emission during the cover crops, uh, during the cropping season. So having a cover crop definitely helps you save carbon. And it, it, these two plots are side by side, exactly side by side. Now, then we, we wanted to get some credits for ourselves. So we kind of came up with this. So I presented this to last year's society meetings, agronomic society meetings in, uh, in, in Baltimore. So we had to come up with a cool name. So we said potential soil respiration, which is the difference of a soil respiration coming out of crop field and coming out of a fallow adjacent to it. So it's the difference. So how much, so there is 420, 415 ppm of carbon dioxide coming out all the time. But when you have a crop, how much it is coming out from the soil? What is the concentration of carbon dioxide then? Is the, when you can include the respiration, the root respiration, the microbial respiration, the soil respiration overall. We're measuring potential soil respiration, and this is in wheat. And you see that during the daytime it goes down and then it comes back up uh, in the afternoon. And uh, so, so we can use potential soil respiration as a soil health indicator. And now what we're trying to do is figure out if our soil and plant parameters can correlate with that. Because we are, we are collecting too many data, too much data. This, these sensors, they'll give you a lot of data. So we're calibrating that, we're working with different professionals, people who can uh, you know, look at the data in a different way, like data scientists and machine learning specialists. We're working with them too, modelers. So yeah, I'll, just two more slides. So we all know soil penetrometer and now, don't use it, friend, because it's very cheap nowadays. So people like expensive things, you know, to measure. But penetrometer, $40, $50, $70 penetrometer can give you a good sense of the areas in your soil that require some management for your soil. It's also soil uh, structure based, like soil physical strength, soil resiliency based measurement. And it can tell you exactly if you go, you do enough measurement. You will have a good sense like where your soil should be at the end of the growing season or at the beginning of the growing season, or if, you're, if, you're, if it is going declining or if you're, you're maintaining it. You can get data very simply. So with everything, I also measure uh, penetrometer resistance just to see our soil data. So we can see like carbon with penetrometer, like is that compaction. So if you see better carbon, better health and everything, you see less compaction. It's so day and night kind of thing. It's so easy to see, see that. Oh, I thought I had another slide, but I'm done. Thank the you. Other slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dimon. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Yeah, so, I guess if you don't have a crop that's already in the ground, um, one, two, the added cost of the seed, so 150 pounds, probably cheaper than alfalfa. So 150 pounds per acre of seed. It's going to need some water, and you're not getting even something viable that you could you could bail and sell and make maybe a little bit of the money back on. Are you seeing that this, with our heat and our conditions, might have to be something to be that good of a potential done every year, or is there enough that you could put in from one cover crop to kind of offset, you know, some fertilizer costs? For multiple years, or is it like, are you gonna, is it gonna be gone by the next year? You have to do it again. I'll, I'll take a couple of things because I'm, I'm, I'm getting that too. Some of our growers are told by some people, power crops can be used as a slow release fertilizer, which is true in a sense, but it takes uh, some time to build up that system that so that you can use power crops as a fertilizer. So I'm trying, I'm trying to answer from the last part of your question. So, but when I say cover crop, I'm not saying it has to be a green manure cover crop. And, you know, we have, we have talked about in the last meeting that with forage industry and me, I'm and we are working on that, our proposals and stuff, that how we can use cover crop as an alternative forage so we can find a strike a balance. Like we won't, we will not only leave the roots, which doesn't have any active carbon, but also will leave some part of the above ground biomass, kind of help the microbial community 
to try one. So to answer your question about the cost, there is a cost. There is a cost to have, there is no other way in this whole world, no one could find a single way other than photosynthesis to trap carbon. There is no way. You cannot trap carbon. If you want to improve your carbon in your system, the only way to grow crop, and that is expensive, and you're getting expensive more and more. And water is expensive to grow crops. So there, there is literally no other way, uh, Kyle, because if you need carbon, you have to grow crop. There is no other way. Because how would you get the carbon otherwise? You can add ammonia, but if you add any manure and it is not well treated and there is no crop, it will go like this. It is easy carbon. It is so much soluble nutrients. It, the, the microbes will use it up like this. So we have to keep growing carbon and manage the system so we can modify the release of carbon dioxide. That we have to stop. So we have to make more input than the output because that is not a habit. It's, it's hot and every reaction depends on the temperature. So high temperature helps them release more carbon dioxide anyways. The only way we can, we, can, we can kind of reduce the carbon dioxide emission is growing crop. There is no other way. I mean, this is hard to say, but it is. You have to grow crop or keep that, that above and below ground connection going. Yes. I mean, on that three, I'm kind of wondering like, if you could, if you had, just use an alfalfa as an example. If you're, yes. if you're cutting yeah, so it, it's an alpha, but if it's you're, a perennial crop. So if you, you don't disturb the soil for three, four years, right. five years, and then even if it takes water, I mean, you cannot get crop. Good crop without water. It's it's equation. It's the same. Six uh, atoms of uh, six atoms of uh, no six molecules of carbon dioxide equal to six molecules of water. That's how it goes. That's how that's the photosynthetic equation. It cannot change that. So in to, to get to trap that much carbon, you exactly need that much of water. We are in the best scenario because we have the sunlight. And the other, the other thing is needed is uh, for, for, I mean, photosynthetic light is what we have for the most part of our season. So we are actually lucky to have, not many states can grow crop. So to have carbon in soil, you have to grow crop, you have to add water. And no one talks about it. We, we saw this time, first time, in our society meetings, people started talking about it. I wrote, I published a paper, Bashing cover crop, by the way, though I can say good things about cover crop, but I bash cover crop that it doesn't help, especially rain fed farmers who think that they grow a very good cover crop, but it's actually taking because they are rain fed and they are limited to the budget. Uh, they're the corn and soybean. They're, they're, they're seeing not in soybean that much, but corn. Corn use is going down. We saw, so we did like 85 sites. I think almost 70 plus sites showed negative corn response, undercover crop. And no one is talking about it. First time this year, I think USDA folks started talking about it. I don't know if there is anyone from USDA, but USDA tried, it is a good tool, but if it is not managed well, if you don't have uh, proper tools to manage, because it has to go with the climate, it has to go with the other agronomic management too. There is no other way, but corn crop is not always the great thing to do. But if you want to have carbon, you have to have water, you have to have crop. There is no other way, sadly.